though digital transformation has been talked about and has been around for a very long time and people have been pushing for more ethical um, uh, standards for uh, artificial intelligence, for example, or different types of di digital and remote learning, um, there wasn't, a, how could I say, a dire need um, as COVID has presented uh, before. So it was not taken very seriously and budgets were not committed to advancing these types of technologies. Uh, some countries, uh, be, depending on how, whether they're developed or developing, um, it, it doesn't matter. It, 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 it is, I think it has to do with whether they are forward thinking and visionary to uh, incorporate within their ministries tech ambassadors to allow for the policies that are made within the tech industry to be conducive to the environment that exists. And I think that is something that we also need to address within um, the education system. Uh, every education system in each country is uh, devised and regulated by local ministries and local standards. And uh, we do live in a, in, a, in a globalized world and multilateral institutions play a key role in assisting countries and people within uh, different contexts uh, to, they help guide policy um, to, to also do, to guide research and development in policy. So I think what, what came forth throughout this discussion is, is the need for collective action and bringing minds together and uh, thinking together critically with what the knowledge that already exists, the people that already exist, and the realities and the challenges that are we're facing right now. Um, yes, people don't have access to basic infrastructure, Wi-Fi. This should be something that should be readily available. Come up with guidance, uh, educators can serve in that role uh, to help guide policy. And I think if uh, governments work together with educational institutions, those who are actually on the ground in the classrooms, who are experiencing what the real world challenges are, uh, this helps guide an ethical, moral policy that works for the people that it's supposed to serve. And I think um, educators uh, play an, an incredibly important role and institutions now are are recognizing the importance of including uh, schools and different types of NGOs and civil society organizations to help guide local policy. Um, and I think also that uh, platforms like these, the opportunities that exist within platforms like these, uh, we have to realize that even as we are all here on this platform, we're all in a privileged position. Some people, they don't, they may not, as you said, one family member, even in a middle income family, or uh, might, have, uh, might not have sufficient devices or uh, capacity to support the learning atmosphere at home. Uh, many families may have multiple children um, and they at a very rapid pace had to prepare for remote learning. And so I, I think uh, we have to realize that there are challenges, but those challenges exist across the board. So let's take out the silos. Let's take out who's uh, less advantaged, who's more advantaged, and let's just get to work to see how we can get everyone at the table having the same type of learning atmosphere that existed in the classroom. Uh, I like the idea of having smaller classrooms, but those models have been tested and even following the very, to, to the strictest um, the point, the, uh, all of the regulations, people still have gotten sick. So how do we uh, allow people to have, yes, hybrid models, that's, I think that works. I think atmospheres open, open classrooms, open outdoors, maybe, uh, 
complementing education that is digital with uh, smaller groups uh, that explores in the park or, or in the school's playgrounds or just having shorter meetings uh, with the students so that they're not in, in a closed atmosphere for long, long periods of time. So trying to find policy that actually works for the people um, and also working with, collectively together to try to think outside of the box, see what's possible and realistic uh, within the current atmosphere and also include parents because some parents don't in some developing countries have never used a computer. They don't know how to use them. So let's just face that reality as well. We uh, are, I, I'm, I'm speaking to you from New York um, and it, I, I'm in a developed country. I, I have webinars throughout the day. I have meetings with people in tech companies where their internet jobs. So let's just be let's just be empathetic. Let's just try to find solutions and to have ready um, other op options uh, that are feasible for people to be able to get their work done. Um, some people prefer physical atmospheres and there are so socioeconomic benefits as well as psychosocial benefits of being physically in a room with certain um, age groups because of the way their learning takes place. We also have to uh, take in mind that there are differently abled people. You know, we're having this conversation about education and people from developed countries, even as Ms. John mentioned, where she is as well, in a developed country, within some communities, people don't have access to devices. Imagine differently able students. How are we addressing all of those issues? Um, and uh, I think it, it's clear, um, Ms. Vitelli outlined all of the challenges that we face. The previous speaker also, uh, through her personal experience, um, mentioned challenges of safety and security that is not only physical by not ha knowing what's going on within the home, um, because we do know that statistics have proven that there has been challenges on families. Domestic violence has in increased many other challenges that exist because the home has become stressed. People are being asked to take on roles that they were not used to. Childcare is now having to be done at the same time as doing work. I went to a, a, a virtual brunch um, with CEOs. One of the women, her daughter, wanted to be part of the conversation the whole entire time during a scheduled meeting that we had. So, of course, I understand. We all have to be empathetic of people's situations and try to adapt, not pass judgment, and uh, get to the the, 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 the brunt of, of what needs to be done. In an educational institution, we are, we are here, um, they're there to, to educate people, and that can be in different ways. Education takes place on a daily basis. Uh, uh, we get educated within institutions, but we also learn when we go, you know, when there's take your daughter to work day or take your son to work day, you learn in that environment too. So um, I think Let's just be flexible, let's be adaptable, let's be resilient, but also empathetic, as Ms. Vitelli um, pointed out. And let's work together and, and, and try to find solutions. Uh, Ms. Minz John is, is, has, has brought up some, some real challenges, cybersecurity as well. Zoom, the platform of which we are speaking on, in the initial phases, had real cybersecurity problems. Those calls were being interrupted by hackers. You have, these are things that are real. These are challenges that are real. When you put students in front of an unregulated device, challenges arise. So let's, uh, let's talk about those and uh, let's work together um, in a, in a cross-sectoral, in a cross-every-way. <laughs> Um, uh, to, 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 to get learning 
um, advanced. Everyone needs to learn. More people are being left behind. Not only in developing countries, in developed countries, in villages um, in Africa, yes, but also in communities, small communities in New York, in LA, in Chicago, in London, in Brussels, in every capital of the world. So let's just face that reality and let's, let's not be blinded by our privilege and let's put ourselves in other people's shoes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnny, for all of your words. Now we will be moving on to Samantha Shofrashad. I believe. Samantha, are you there? Samantha is there. Samantha, if you're talking, your mic is on mute. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my mic was on mute. Um, thank you very much for having me here this morning. Um, I just got up. Uh, it's relatively early in the morning in Guyana here. And um, joining in a conversation like this uh, very early in the morning is something great to actually wake up to. And to know that we are already starting to have these type of conversations um, where our world is going through a transformation and we need to come up with relevant solutions to some of our problems. And as Hermina passionately mentioned uh, earlier about some of the infrastructures that we have that needs improvement, which is internet, which is access, uh, looking at providing that access for everyone, whether you're in a small town or you're in a big city, you know, all of these challenges are things that we need to take into consideration. And also we need to be empathetic. And I believe that the role of education on the sustainable development goals is something that is primarily important for our planet right now. Because if you do look at it, um, you know, we are heading, we're almost 10 years away from that goal uh, to be met, from all those goals to be met. And take for example, um, when I got the Queen's Young Leaders Award, I was tasked to learn about the sustainable development goals. And I kept hearing about this goal about prior to five years to that award. and I did not understand the sustainable development goals. And how is it that this goal is important to you as a citizen and you as a country? I never understand that. And what I did, I read about 15 research paper and then I went out into the community where I live and various other communities. And I understand that nobody here knows what we're talking about. Then I went onto the street and we had um, some emblem, uh, the SDGs, um, signs and so forth. And we were asking people, do you know what the SDG is? And somebody, among the many answers that uh, we got, someone responded and said, is it something to eat? So at the same time, I'm looking at this and I'm continuing to do research and understanding, you know, how is this education going to help people? And then I went to, into several schools and I taught the kids about SDGs and the 17 goals. And how is it that we can use these SDG to better our little environment that we have here in the school? So the first thing that I, what I did was to help them to identify a problem that mostly affect them. And in that exercise, they were able to learn about the different SDG because everyone had different problems that was affecting them. And in that little exercise, persons came up with uh, pollution, a uh, person came up with violence in school, um, Education was a big one because uh, there were kids who are suffering from some form of disability and 
there were some kids who believe that they're they're part of an education system that does not serve them but rather um deny their creativity so what happened there was a real case study that emerged into understanding more challenges that young people are facing across the planet and now moving towards a virtual world with those problems it becomes very very problematic because not everyone understands how to use the technology not everyone have access to technology and i believe in education is the foundation of any developing economy or nation and we need to strive to educate our population even through if it's virtual because i would have used uh prior to to going to school and looking at how is it that i can reach a wider spread um to to other parts of the nation i would have gone to youtube to make videos and talk about sustainable development and how is it important what role it can play in our uh societal development um and all this would have probably done about 3 or 4 years ago so the the preparation was there but the impact and magnitude that i wanted to execute uh did not come because many times when you as a young person come up with a lot of project ideas you're not being supported even by your government you're told that there is not a budget there for that and there is not this type of infrastructure you always hear the not so you know you as an individual who have so many challenge within your country even though you're an ambassador um if i am an ambassador and i'm facing so much challenge with a government telling me no imagine what many other young persons are facing out there who don't even have a title who don't even have a voice to say you know this is affecting me this is bothering me so many times we talk about youth and we speak about youth empowerment but really and truly there is not much infrastructure or budget to support that and those are the things that need to be changed and uh thank you very much once again for including me in this powerful conversation because i believe that i would have lent my voice um through the kind of work that i've been doing and through the type of analysis that have been taking place in some of our more, more pressing challenges in our real world thank you very much everyone for your attention and listening thank you so much uh, samantha and uh, and i think uh, one thing that i've seen is that I'll, that these uh, program that we had, when we had started the idea was to break this program down into these different dialogue series so that instead of having just conversations about of education at large we are able to really go dig deeper into these issues and uh, and now like 17th we are starting for instance with the gender sessions as well and uh, and there will be intersectionality of these issues so at some point i would love to reach out to all of you guys to see how do we now translate these into action steps local action steps um regional action steps international action steps maybe policy advocacy on them but but then i think we have every base covered in terms of people who are here but uh, you know in spirit of what samantha said about uh, about this not being available to a lot of people we tried to make sure that one voice comes from a place where this technology doesn't uh, happen but because of compassion showed by one another human being who has access to technology uh, that is claudia from uh, brazil india our partners for climate dialogues they are based in Bra in the amazonian forests in brazil uh, in brazil they managed to get us the real sense of what uh, sort of uh, what someone from there has to say about it i'm going to show this video and after that take uh, the 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 sort of a closing remark on this whole panel uh, in terms of uh, the keynote that is made and then we will be moving to our further speakers on this role of education institutions in a in a more uh, for, uh, you know in a in a deeper way 
uh, and also if uh, you are able to talk about some concrete actions in terms of what should we do and what will you commit to do if you would then i think uh, like this call to action that has been made through this program uh, it's really answered in the way that we really hope it is so with that i thank you all of you and catalina uh, is is another example of someone who's using technology to to prove her metal i think to prove to adults that uh, that anyone can moderate a session and uh, uh, if they prepare well and catalina has just uh, showed it so like my all my admiration to catalina for all of these uh, the way you're working and uh, now i want to show you this video so please uh, follow your screens um and uh, this is ian speaking from brazil from the amazonian forests there Hi there, my name is Ian. I'm 15 years old and I live in Novaron in the Amazon in Brazil. Right now we are in the Rio Negro. And I'm going to speak about the difficulties and the good side of living here. The the difficulties of living here for a young person is to continue studies because after high school you don't have a university that's near so you have to go to a bigger city that's not that's a long that's a long distance from here my house so for many young people that's not possible so that's a uh, bad thing of living here and a good a good a good side is that you can distract yourself with nature you can go fishing you can explore you can uh, go swimming in the river there's a lot of things good things that you can do and now i'm going to speak about my expectation for the future i would like to study biology or uh, something that in, would involve me with uh, with the place where I where like, I live in that's here, something that would make me like work here and help the people that live here, and that's what I want for my future. Yes, um, so that's what Ian wants from his future, and what are educational institutions going to do about it uh, for Ian, right? Uh, what we could do about it was to get his voice to you, as uh, the Dias or the Dias Global Voices program. Now, what to do with Ian's call is something that we should definitely ask our coming speakers, uh, and. Um, so, Catalina, who do we have in store now? Next, next speaker. Uh, no, is... we are doing first the closing from the concluding remarks on this circle with uh, our esteemed um, keynote speaker. Uh, so, we are going to hear from pa just Paula one one more time before we throw this question also. So, Paula, if you can also set the ground for this role of educational institutions in this STG agenda now, uh, tying it with what Ian wants. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited uh, to hear everybody's opinions. I think that um, they, they've enriched the discussion greatly. For one, I hadn't considered the role that parents need to play, um, as Dr. John mentioned, in terms of educating them on the technology as well and making them comfortable with it so that they can help their children and guide them 
in this online learning. So that's one aspect. The other important thing that was mentioned was the fact that it's not only developing countries, but also developed countries uh, different communities are, are experiencing shortfalls in terms of access to technology and the necessary means to be able to continue with online learning, even if they're in New York, which is also very important. Um, the third aspect is uh, cybersecurity, which is something we hadn't considered in the past, but and to the extent that everybody becomes more connected, then I think we're more open to these kind of threats and I'm not exactly sure what we can do regarding that. Um, I think that that's too early to tell and I and we would have to, to consider that further because I'm not sure that even the experts know exactly what it means. Um, and lastly, you know, this video that we just saw is very endearing to me for many reasons. One of them is the fact that I recognize the landscape. You know, Colombia is also um, Part of the Amazon region and so many of that that landscape is very familiar to me and I know how remote uh, that location is and how difficult it is in terms of logistics to be able to be there so I understand um, the plight that this um, Brazilian boy is facing in terms of having access to education um, and this is where I think that in a remote geographical location such as this one where this boy may not have the ability means or resources to travel elsewhere to get an education online learning is a beautiful thing not only to lift him out of his um, uh, constraints but also to help his community and his family so this is one uh, of the really strong points of online learning is be being able to access children and people in the planet that would not ah, have the educational opportunities that they would have otherwise. So um, with that said, I think that online learning is here to stay, but we also need to inform it adequately with adequate content to help uh, students all over the world with their own challenges and in their own social context to achieve their own, own goal, goals, but also uh, to become more empathetic um, and compassionate in terms of what other people are experiencing along with what we are experiencing ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Visitelli, for your closing remarks, as well as the introduction to our next topic, which we'll be discussing the Brazilian video from the boy in the Amazons, Ian. So we'll be opening this topic with the next couple of speakers in the following order. First is Dr. Valia. Next is Suda Reddy. Next is Nina Puri. And lastly will be Dr. Vora speaking on this topic. So if Dr. Valia would like to begin, the floor is open. Yeah, thank you, Catalina. And warm welcome from India <laughs> to everyone. Yep. Yeah. Um, we are a developing country. Uh, there's scarcity of resources here. And suddenly, because of this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are finding ourselves in an unprecedented situation uh, because technology is not available and it's not accessible to everyone. Uh, infrastructure is not in good shape. And, uh, uh, and frankly, you know, we are out of our comfort zone. Um, so we, there's a big challenge for all educational institutions. And whenever a situation like this arises, you know, we have to go back to basics. Um, so far, we have been thriving on our economies in the world are thriving on uh, cutthroat competition, it's always, you know, us versus them. Uh, there was never a degree of cooperation and people uh, kept playing games with each other. Uh, so a lot of, it, it gave birth to a lot of social issues, uh, issues which has, uh, which have tormented the entire world. So where do we stop? Uh, we were not going to stop, uh, but this pandemic has, uh, put a stop and it has you know, brought everything to grinding uh, halt. 
uh, now the economy is, world economy is in shambles. And uh, again, you know, the question is, where do we look, uh, look on to? So we have to look to ourselves, uh, you know, in the East, there have been sages who have always advocated the middle path, uh, you know, the great Buddha. Even Buddha said, you should always walk the middle, take the middle path where you are aware of your social responsibilities and your selfish motives. Uh, similarly, Guru Nanak from Sikhism, he also advoca advocated, uh, he said, you should not go to Himalayas to find salvation. You'll find your salvation if you act responsibility and work for society while living in society. So with these words, uh, I would like to go back to the role of institutions. What can institution do in such a situation? As I said, technology, only technology is not going to help. And it's a long way for us to implement technological solution fully uh, because the infrastructure is not in place. and. Uh, uh, even there are financial constraints with our students because not many will have success, uh, access to technological tools. And also teachers are not comfortable. They are in a dilemma what to do because they, they haven't had any kind of training in using technology. And uh, you know the training will be a big headache for them. Um, so what's the way forward? The way forward is that we have to go for uh, blended learning in our situation um, where we use technology judiciously, whatever is, applicable, uh, whatever is available with us, uh, we should go for mass media channels like television, I think can be very useful. And we're also developing, I mean, uh, till the time we have interactive solution available with us, we can go for uh, mass media, education channels such as uh, television. We can tap television and uh, it's, efforts are being done in that regard. And then we have to, um, you know, the internet is, uh, I mean, they, they are speeding up uh, the installation of internet infrastructure now, even in small cities in India. And we are, uh, I think, uh, within a short period, we'll be able to have good access. But again, the problem is that, that access won't be available in villages, uh, you know, in the remote areas, which are not uh, the central hubs. So that's a big challenge for us. Um, so to uh, cover that, I'm suggesting that we should go for a blended learning model where we uh, invite some students to our institution with adequate social distancing because human touch and the practical work has to go on. And if we take some precautions, um, that will be pretty good for them as well as for education institutions as well. And uh, now, you know, I was hearing, I was listening to uh, the speakers and they said that uh, they were talking about sustainable development, uh, what is the way forward, uh, what should institutions be doing? Uh, now look at the Ivy League universities or all top shot universities in the world. Uh, I think what they need to do is that they have to get out of their comfort zone and they have to expand their operations. You know, look at the popularity of MOOCs. Uh, now massive online courses are a big hit nowadays uh, instead of uh, limiting the number of students, uh, these universities or top-notch uh, institutions should expand their operations and they should, um, you know, they should make them um, credible for, for the employers because employers think that uh, online courses are not credible. They don't impart in the kind of skills and knowledge which is required in industry or businesses. So if they are able to do that, you know, if they design their, you know, the, the onus is on them to design their courses in such a way that they become credible, they are acceptable in the industry and businesses, and a lot more people are able to join them. 
I think that will be a big boon to the uh, student community. So, you know, all the top uh, institutions, number one, they must expand their operation. They must introduce more courses which are credible and acceptable and have, uh, you know, acceptable recognized qualifications for the industry. That is number one. And the second thing is they should also, they shouldn't just focus on, uh, you know, just knowledge and skills and preparing executives who are, you know, always uh, um, moving about here and there and always trying to compete with uh, each other. Uh, they should, you know, as I said, they should follow the middle path. I mean, they should be good in achieving their targets, but they should also have a lot more inclination towards social good because they are part of society and they have responsibility and duty towards society. They shouldn't forget that. So we need to inculcate, you know, those ethical skills and that ethical attitude in them uh, so that they are not uh, just top shot executives uh, moving at jet speed. Uh, they should and they should contribute positively to uh, to sorry. hello am i audible hello uh, yes sir we can hear you i think there's some technical error with dr walia some very pertinent remarks already made yes sir can you hear us hello yes sir yeah so you we can hear you sir hello dr. am i audible dr walia you can continue please hello hello yes sir we can hear you but uh, uh okay uh okay so this is uh, one of the things that happens in our online discussion sir we can't hear you dr walia if you can hear us uh uh, Chris, Catalina, let's let's wait for Dr. Walia to return, fix his audio. Hello. Yes. Sir, can you hear us? Can you hear us? I think he got disconnected. Uh, okay. Now, uh, Arturo, I've been looking at you in the screen for, for a while. I've been resisting not to bring you in so far, but I really want to just hear what Fox is hearing because grand narrative uh, has to be strengthened through this whole process. Would you like to maybe like, I'm sorry to put you in a spot, but would you like to weigh in a little bit, please? Of course, of course. Yeah, I've, I've heard someone yesterday saying that you have this uh, very bad habit to bring people uh, on the spot without, uh, without uh, telling in advance, but uh, it's with great pleasure. Um, so, if I if I can summarize uh, if I can summarize Fox and the grand narrative, um, so Fox is a Brussels-based think and do tank, uh, and we primarily try to advocate uh, through this grand narrative for a new globalization that is uh, fair and just for the people and uh, for the planet itself. So. The grand narrative. We always uh, want to insist that uh, it's it's not an ideology; it's an open and, and continuous narrative that seeks to connect the human beings to each other and uh, and to the world around them. So to the beings in general. So the grand narrative relies relies on three pillars, which are the um, global governance, global citizenship, and global sustainability. So here you can you can clearly hear the um, importance of the word global. That is what we are aiming for. Like I said, a globalization that is fair and just for the people and and for the planet itself. And um, beside that, yeah, I I really wanted to to thank you, Keshav and and the whole team, for including everyone with uh, so much sympathy and and love in your dialogues. It means a lot to us. And, um, and then I need to say that I'm really impressed by all of you guys, organizers and speakers, for showing so much passion and, and bringing so much energy to your project and, and your beliefs. Because I think that's what, what it actually takes 
we like to, to speak of hopes, of hope, sorry. We, we at Fox are defending a grand narrative of hope for the people, and that is wonderful. But I think that you also need energy and passion to make things happen, to, to make dreams come true, and, and to make utopias uh, become realities. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Arturo. I think uh, these comments are so important because uh, we have been just really brainstorming a lot on how do we take these 40 global conversations across these themes, how do we put it into action? And one of the solutions that, uh, that Dr. Giorgio, who's our program advisor uh, and uh, one of the key members at FOGS, and we uh, realized uh, in our discussions was that the grand narratives, pillars, can be probably utilized to collate. Like our education dialogues can strengthen the education element of the grand narrative. Uh, the arts dialogue can, it, it can do that. Uh, uh, you know, there are all these issues. So, which is why I think it's, uh, we really appreciate you, uh, Arturo, for putting in this perspective, uh, for contextualizing this discussion so well for all of the other speakers. And uh, we hope, and all of, this is for all of you to know that all these discussions that we are happening, uh, they are going to go here on the Fox website. And there is a very important magazine that is Kitoikos, where uh, there is this section um, in which we are discussing this entire dialogue series, all the updates that is the world UN 75 plus 25 generation. Uh, I think, uh, and that generation is something that Catalina belongs to as much as Arturo and I, and uh, everyone belongs to because it's a mindset, uh, you know, and, uh, and here the team has done a very good job putting the whole program into context. So I'm saying that, uh, my own key learning so far has been that everyone has a role to play. No matter what that role is, um, some, like, like for me, if, if a Mark Knopfler or a David Gilmore were to come to this forum one day and talk about oh. like what they did on Live Aid and how that is relevant today. So I don't know that guy personally, but someone might, right? Now their action is very big when that guy comes and uh, someone else is doing something else in wherever space they are. And this was my fundamental learning in the Nepal earthquake when I was doing relief work that uh, although my immediate emotional sort of responsibility and reactions wanted me to go and help people physically give them stuff, get physical gra gratification validation out of that, my job was to put strategies together to build capacity with young people so more of them can go out every day and do what they are do what what i can't do because i am very bad with running uh, uh, you know and uh, lifting stuff so if somebody has to do that they can then obviously do that better than me while i can maybe do some other stuff that i can lift ideas and project structures maybe and the email that's pretty heavy lifting nowadays i've realized that's the more heavy lifting so, uh, so everyone has a role, whether it's a student or a, or a professor or a academician um, at, at a think tank anywhere. And uh, th that really sort of, that, that also becomes then the centrality of it. That ties not only people across identities, but also their dialogue expression and the silos can be broken when we start with that ethic of responsibility, maybe. And I think uh, like just moving with that, uh, I want to get Sudha ma'am now in and uh, after Sudha ma'am we have uh, uh, again accomplished speakers Dr. Amarjeet Singh also joining in and uh, we have uh, uh, so when she began with Sudha ma'am then uh, we move to these two speakers and then Catalina is going to announce the other uh, the, the preceding speakers so thank you all um, Sudha ma'am what is this ethic that can tie all of us together Thank you very much, uh, Kesha and other speakers. Really very inspirational when I was listening to each one of you. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I think I joined a bit late. I'm uh, Sudha, Sudha Reddy. I live in Bangalore, that is in uh, South India. Um, basically, I'm a social activist as well as a kind of um, researcher and you know, I'm into 
jack of all, master of none. I can say about myself. Um, I have a small uh, uh, kind of an organized NGO called Eco Foundation for Sustainable Alternatives, through which uh, we work at the grassroots in the village, rural, uh, very remote villages. Uh, with the children, women, and uh, basically the community development, which includes, of course, education, more of an informal education. And at the same time, uh, I was wondering why Keshu called me into this particular, like uh, in the in educational institutions. Perhaps he thought that uh, um, because uh, I also, um, I'm also in a very prestigious, uh, uh, school, National Law School of India um, University. Actually, I'm surrounded by the kind of, um, you know, very, very bright students from all over the, all over India as well as from uh, abroad. Uh, that is where there is a small a research center called the Center for the Child and the Law. That is where right now I'm also involved in the kind of uh, working on the sustainable development uh, uh, goal two, that is for the right to food and uh, nutrition, and uh, also uh, on the kind of so it's part of the early childhood uh, education, early childhood development. So I think Kesho must have thought of that, looking at my surroundings, uh, you know, where I every day I'm in that, uh, you know, a, a very prestigious institution, uh, almost, I mean, every day. So anyway, uh, yes, uh, I listen to each one of you. It's really very remarkable and your own experiences and uh, what you have been sharing. Uh, then I looked at, um, uh, you know, like I would like to share something what actually happened when there is no internet at all. Because of all of us, uh, I mean, like the present thing is, completely is we are into digital education and everybody is talking about online though we know that there is a lot of issues like internet uh, um, in connectivity or um, uh, uh, access to internet access to the um, like laptops or whatever mobiles and all that uh, so but still um, I tell you what happened uh, when the lockdown in India I mean like especially in my part where I uh, in the remote villages. Obviously, uh, my focus is basically with the government pr primary schools. This is the government schools. It's uh, actually with uh, very, very minimum infrastructure, I can say. Uh, I mean, any whether it's about the education, about anything, even, uh, you know, uh, it's a part of, uh, I mean, it's a very minimum. Sometimes you don't have even proper te uh, you know, teachers there. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure our, um, you know, Indian uh, professors, I mean, uh, education is definitely would uh, understand that what I'm talking about. Uh, so in this situation, uh, with absolutely no online, they, it's not possible to have any online classes for them. It's not possible. Uh, it's only possible here mainly with the, uh, in the city bred uh, kind of uh, private schools. Of course, the private schools are charging the fees so that, you know, the, even from the first standard onwards, they are insisting the children to go on online uh, education, I mean, classes, basically. But what we did is that in these villages is impossible. So, uh, in a, very interestingly, many, uh, uh, like, volunteers, basically, including the government uh, school teachers, we started a kind of a, uh, you know um, gathering you know with the local at a, in their own uh, nearby uh, areas collecting the children from age group from say from um, uh, kind of a pre primary or primary to the 10th class but basically dividing into two three batches and making them to sit in one place anywhere whether it is in a temple whether it is in a open space whether it is in a kind of any house or anything whatever is possible so we started like you know uh, taking the classes little bit of education i mean little bit of academic uh, you know kind of reading writing mathematics or something but most of it is more of an action based very creative activities for them so that to be engaged 
um, I mean, keep them engaged at least for two to three uh, three hours. So every day happened. It started with a few committed teachers and a few volunteers, but gradually it's such a it's so developed. I mean, it's increased to such an extent that. Um, in fact, even the go the officers who are going to the government, I mean, those who are working in the government or any other uh, officers, they also started joining. They used to come in the morning for a while and then uh, they used to attend their you know, office hours and all that. So it's such a thing. It became a kind of a movement. And in Kannada, in my language, it is called Watara Shalegalu. Watara means kind of a neighborhood, you know. It's, it's not a literal meaning, but it's kind of a neighborhood schools. So that now government recognized that kind of a service. How without even you know, uh, you know, even without online, how we could engage the children, uh, you know, with a little bit of academic and also the playful. But basically, it's a learning process. So government also recognized, identified, and uh, in fact supported. It's not with any money. It's completely voluntary work and it's still going on. I mean, I'm proud to say that it just started in small, a few villages. Now it has spread over to the district. And I'm happy the Karnataka government educational dep department recognized this process. Why I would like, wanted to say this, because, you know, we know that the issue with the online education, online, you know, but what is education, first of all? I mean, my basic uh, you know, um, uh, me, uh, you know, concern. What is education? Are we? I mean, you know, I need not repeat that. You know, it is uh, certainly we don't agree with any competitive. Uh, you know, thing. there is an ethic. There is a basis for the education. It is not mere literacy. It is not mere. You know, going and learning and getting a job. It is not mere knowledge. You know, knowledge, technical knowledge is. It's all, uh, uh, they are all technologies is all only part, tool. It's not uh, something, entire thing for a uh, uh, development of the human being. How we can make a human being to a humane being, how we make an individual to the global, global citizen. Sometimes I have a problem with calling citizen because in India we do have we, people without actually the rights and uh, of the citizens so i i uh, i always call them people only so the you know how to make humane how to make um, a global uh, compassionate human beings how to bring this compassionate uh, civilization i mean i know i go to that extent it's kind of a dream of course so then i would like to just give you a kind of i mean i'm sure for our indian uh, scholars they all know about all these things but just to give a glimpse, those are the young people, if they are not, maybe many of you are aware of, I would like to touch upon Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi's idea of education. It is called, an, um, uh, it's called, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nai Talim. It's a new education. Sir, I, am I right when I pronounce that? Uh, you know, Nai Talim? I think, uh, I think, I think it's okay. So I would like to share with you. So what kind of education we need ultimately? What kind of education which makes a, a, a biological being, an individual to the collective uh, a person, uh, a collective consciousness, and then biological to the humane being. I'm not talking about human being. We still have our evolving. We are not a human being. That's an, another uh, discussion we can get into. <laughs> okay. So I would just, I would like to share with you, what is Gandhi idea of Nayi Talim? That is the new education. It is actually based, it has a moral basis and uh, social and political economic aspects for the development of youth. Gandhi's education is designed through three aspects or through uh, three heads, that means head, heart, hand. These three is head, heart, and hand represent knowledge. Um, Dr. Sudaradi, are you still there? I think that the video might have frozen. 
uh, but it happens a lot like because uh, her area network is pretty bad so again the, like these are challenges we are talking about then this is living them experiencing them so nothing better to learn uh, in such situations uh, uh, let's look at uh, so so Catalina. Uh, do we have Dr. Vora with us now? Dr. Vora and Dr. Amarjeet Singh, Dr. Puri, are the other esteemed panelists. So in the meantime, let's get them. Uh, let's get to hear what what their perspectives are. They are uh, all at the regional college. So I want to know that after all this discussion, what is it that they have taken away, and what is it that they can do as administrators, as faculty? as the educational institution which is going to be working with us on 50,000 children and youth for SDGs in the next five years. And I hope that uh, Paolo, Paola is in, included in that to guide them, that Arturo is there to guide them, that all partner organizations, they all come together, you know, to, to ensure that these 50,000 multiply to 5 million young people just trying to achieve, uh, if nothing, uh, carbon emission control. I mean, let me just go on one basic level that uh, we can get the tipping points of temperatures back. So I, I, I think uh, Rameshwar Das sir, has also joined us. So Dr. Bora, would you like to weigh in on? Hello, thank you, Keshav and Katlina. Am I audible? Yes, Dr. Hello. Yes, 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 Dr. Vera. Please carry on, sir. Okay. Ah, at the onset, I would like to congratulate the entire DAIS team and Guru Nanak Khalsa College, Yamunanagar, for organizing today's dialogue. The sustainable development goals are so relevant in the present scenario that if taken in a true spirit, it can bring in desired changes. The fulfillment of these goals shall be a great endeavor for people, planet, and prosperity. At the same time, we all know that this discussion is taking place in the time of pandemic, that is COVID-19. When circumstances have changed, and it will affect the teaching learning process as well. We need to address and tackle this situation jointly to achieve our goals. I know we are short of facilities. Technologies are not available for everyone. Connectivity issues are there as everyone has mentioned. But still, life must move on. And we must think how to make things available to everyone. And of course, we all will agree that blended learning is the need of the art. I was listening to Sudha ma'am and was feeling that these steps or efforts are the way forward to realize SDGs, we accommodations, are fortunate enough and sensitize them towards the societal needs like environment protection, gender equality, pollution hazards, and dangers of plastic and so on and so forth. Beyond doubt, present situation has increased our responsibility as a teacher manifold. But at the same time, I must feel the educational institutions can play a significant role in achieving the agenda set by United Nations by making available the sensitized human being for the future. Let me talk about educational institutions in India. India is fortunate to have a significant chunk of its population as young people, and it is beyond doubt that this youth population can bring the desired change, provided that each segment contributes to the fullest and the sought after manner to realize the agenda 2030. We, by motivating the youth about SDGs and agenda 2030, can infuse a sense of responsibility in them 
to give practical shape to these SDGs in their respective careers. Let's say the youth of country when becomes entrepreneur, he may think about having such a startup which can contribute to the society. For instance, the startup idea may relate to sanitation in slums and rural areas, or it may be indigenously developed technology setup. Further, youth as a manager or top level executive can order to use green raw material and can also spend CSR funds in society centric activity, keeping SDG in mind. Youth as a political or public servant can help in eradication of corruption and implementation of government flag fee scheme for the benefit of the society. Now, here comes an important question in my mind. That is how to propagate about all these SDGs. Like there is less awareness about SDGs in the people. So I have certain ideas in my mind so as to give popularity and realize these objectives. For this purpose, Keshavji, as you have set up a lab in our college, we are thankful to you. Many such labs may be set up. So the first idea to popularize these SDGs is setting up labs like DAES. Second, by conducting seminars and discussion on SDGs from time to time, like you know what we are having today. Another, by enrolling more and more students year by year, and they must be sensitized towards SDGs because there must be realization that we have such kind of goals. And you know, in this regard, fortunately, as I'm the coordinator of training and placement cell of Guru Nanak Khalsa College, therefore, I can use this platform to motivate the students. Another thing that comes in my mind, by assigning projects related to SDG goals to the students. And ultimately, these projects may be given as per the different SDGs and as per the feasibility environment on educational institution. I know it's a tough time to tackle with this pandemic. And right now, the only thing that is coming in my mind is we need to be positive. If we are positive, things will be sorted out problems will be sorted out and ultimate goals of SDG will be achieved. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Vora. Some very, very, I think you have put such a great structure, uh, at least one model for, uh, for, uh, for many people to now look at, uh, you know, like Catalina is in New York uh, and uh, sh she can look at maybe one part of it if she wants to, which is relevant for her or the whole of it. And uh, like all of us are in different places doing this. And you and I, when we achieve this over technology uh, and the impact it will have will be on the real ground. I think that reconciliation depends then at the will of the people, the intention of the people as to what do they really want to achieve out of that technology. So, uh, so th thank you so much, sir. I think another speaker, a uh, couple of speakers who we, we are sort of deeply honored to have is uh, Dr. Nina Puri. And uh, then uh, one, like one person that I, I almost felt that I had no clue about something and enlightened me in one of these dialogues is Dr. Amarjeet Singh. He's a, he's a leading environmentalist. And, uh, and I know that uh, Paula also works, has done some tremendous work in uh, climate. So, uh, so I'm, we are very deeply honored to have you, sir. You lead the solution creations, you lead the solution implementation, but you also stay behind the scenes as, as researchers uh, who are giving us this critical data, who are looking at the real problems, uh, especially stuff like climate change, which is very fundamental to all of us. And uh, we think we know it, then the scientists tell us the real story of it sometimes. So. Uh, Dr. Puri, Dr. Uh, Dr. Amarjeet Singh, please. If uh, is Dr. Ne Dr. Nina Puri, if you're trying to speak. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Welcome to okay. our forum, ma'am. 
Thank you so much, Keshavji. I'm really feeling privileged to be a part of this webinar. And I being a microbiologist, even I am astonished after the pandemic has erupted. It's been caused by an invisible microorganism, but it has brought changes at the macro level. And our education sector has also been affected very hardly. All of a sudden, lockdowns were announced in various nations. The schools and colleges got closed. The classroom teachings stopped all of a sudden. The online teaching methods ushered in and teachers as well as the students, they were really not technology savvy to all of a sudden adapt to all these technologies. We are still in the phase of downloading certain new apps, adapting to new modes of teaching, uh, downloading them. The students are facing it very hard to understand the topics in the absence of a teacher. And we also feel handicapped to teach the students when they're not physically present in front of us because we really can't read their minds, what they're grasping, what they're not understanding. So it's a two way problem. The students are facing a problem and the teachers are facing a problem of their own sort. But as far as uh, I personally feel, that awareness and adaptability, they are the key to success in any given situation. So the same is true about the pandemic also. Rather, each day in our life gives us a new challenge. All we need to have is patience, determination, and positivity. Now, hybrid teaching, that is partial online and partial offline teaching, seems to be the way out in the present situation. So rather than cribbing about, rather than finding lacunas, rather than finding faults or drawbacks in the system, what I believe is with an open mind, we should accept the change. And we should try to uh, update ourselves. And also we should motivate the students that there is nothing to fear about. All you have to do is to change your mindset, to adapt to these things and uh, uh, nothing will be impossible for them. Uh, in a short span of time, I think they will be able to adapt to this technology and will be getting effective results also. Uh, one other thing that uh, I personally feel is uh, that uh, primary level students and uh, some of the students, uh, maybe up to even 10th, would be attending the schools uh, during uh, at least for one semester. So I think this time is very crucial for the parents as well. They have to play the role of the teachers. When the students, they meet us physically in the college or in the school, uh, we not only impart the education of our subject, but we also teach them certain moral values. Uh, we focus on their personality development, which we may not be able to do via the online teaching. So the onus lies on the parents also that they have to inculcate these values uh, uh, and they have to keep their uh, children away from the vices and other bad habits they might develop uh, being at home, the stress level they are going through because most of them may not be meeting their friends and uh, pouring their heart out and feeling easy and all. So I think uh, the present situation demands a lot from the teacher, from the students, from the parents, so that we have a healthy nation and a healthy world around us. Another thing which I feel is uh, that the young minds, they are really uh, easy to uh, uh, change, I can say. They are in the budding stages. So these primary level students, uh, they need to be given moral education also along with the uh, subjects they are taught in the school. Like they have to be taught empathy, compassion. They have to be mindful. They have to be nature loving. Uh, only then I think we can have a sustainable uh, future for us. And I think in order to bring this external change, we need to change ourselves internally, our mind, our heart, our brain, all should work, work in synchrony and our habits, our characters. Uh, we should have such habits that we should be compelled by will rather than being compelled or forced by others to be nature uh, sensitive, uh, not to uh, destroy our nature, not to overuse or misuse any of the resources. So I think uh, in the school level, 
as far as the educational institutions are concerned especially in the tiny toddlers the main focus should be to inculcate the moral values uh, the moral stories can be inculcated in the curriculum there should be the lessons the real life stories so it is imbibed in the personality of the child to be uh, sensitive uh, towards our environment towards our needs towards our fellow beings so but then we come to the college level there the things are a bit different uh, the students by that time have already formed most of the habits and it's really hard to change them so at that point of time uh we have to tackle with them differently like uh, we have the goals of our sdgs i think we can have clubs in the college these clubs can uh, spread awareness in the community in the uh, college among other people who are not uh, club members and then competitions and events should be held from time to time and they must be rewarded suitably uh, especially the students who are putting in a good labor and giving out good results Uh, some weightage can be given to these students who are really working towards uh, sustainability of our uh, environment so that they feel motivated to do it uh, making these things a compulsory part of the curriculum it may develop an aversion in the students they may take it as another subject rather than uh, uh, thinking it as their duty uh, to be uh, environment friendly or nature friendly uh so i think uh, the role of uh, parents the role of teachers in the schools and the role of teachers in the colleges is really crucial at every stage of life when we the border line of a world which was 100% uh, 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 the teaching was going on by the physical means and now it's hardly a physical in uh, also i think it's uh, more of a change of the mindset and to accept it positively and uh, i think we'll have uh, good results in the coming future we should take it as challenge and we should try to to say have a good day all hello thank you ma'am thank you Dr. Amarjit Singh, Dr. Rameshwar Das, your final remarks. Then we will be having two to three uh, uh, remarks of any audience members, participants who are not panelists, so that we know broadly, so the panelists know uh, what the, what the audience has taken away from this discussion as well. Uh, and uh, then we will be having a a very very nice, I know, very intense set of discussions. So a very nice poetry performance. by pankaj who is a student and a very talented poet uh, in guru nanak khalsa college our regional partners and we have ha we have the pleasure of having an artist of uh, his stature among us and uh, th th then we will just be hearing alok sir's uh, vote of thanks uh, who is issuing it on behalf of college so so that's the program ahead uh, so far dr amarjit singh sir mm -hmm. <coughs> hello hello kesha okay, uh yes sir we can hear you sir amarjit okay, singh okay okay uh, thank you keshav and katalina uh, thank you dais for giving me this opportunity to speak on uh, this topic of uh, role of institutions in implementing sdgs as a student of ecology as uh, it's known to me the idea of sustainable development was adopted in earth summit that was held in 1992 in rio de janeiro and in 2015 uh, un fixed certain uh, sustainable development goals that was 17 in number uh, by 2030 we have to achieve all these goals and uh, already 5 years have passed and what we have done so far i shall be touching on some of the goals which are interrelated and they are very important uh, because we are seeing through a phase uh, which is uh, we are popularly discussing as covid 19 pandemic first uh, goal is poverty then zero hunger the third one is about good health and well being and uh, you know we are so much afraid of this covid 19 right now 
but a parallel pandemic that is going on that i usually mention that is of environmental degradation uh the data presented by an organization called as uh, global alliance on health and pollution in 2019 mentioned that india and china uh, lose almost uh, more than 2 millions more than 2 millions of lives every year because of environmental degradation and millions of people all over all over the world are suffering from uh, the disability adjusted life and millions of years are lost in that and you know it's not only the demise of people or uh, the adjustment of the people with the the ill health this uh, is uh, uh, severely affecting our economic growth and uh, as per one estimation we are losing at least a quarter of our gdp losing a quarter of our gdp is a big setback to our economy then secondly if we speak about uh, another goal of providing clean water that is a big issue all over the world around 2 billion people still lack access to clean drinking water and children below the age of 5 are the most uh, sufferers because uh, diarrhea is just one disease killing the maximum number of children in the earlier age so uh, th- this being the water borne disease because of contaminated water uh, we are suffering huge losses then uh, providing clean energy in most of the countries uh, our economies are based on fossil fuels and you know in a country like india we have to spend a huge amount of uh, uh, foreign exchange in importing these crude oils and uh, uh, that's how all these th- things are telling upon our uh, 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 economies and that is uh, one of our sustainable development goals which mentions uh, that we should have decent workplace and economic growth but uh, there is a famous saying that uh, if you plan for one year then you need to plant rice if you plan for 10 years then you plant trees and if you plan to have uh, uh, for your centuries for generations to come then you need to educate your uh, people so uh, i shall be focusing on uh, how our uh, higher education institutions or universities have uh, tried to implement all these sdgs uh, you see uh, there was a uh, suit filed in the honorable supreme court of india in 1988 and uh, this honorable court gave its verdict in 1991 to implement environmental education and in that ugc uh, incorporated the course on sustainable development but unfortunately for uh, about 13 years most of the states were not able to implement it and since 2004 uh, when the orders were uh, implemented strictly we have been following the theoretical aspect of uh, environmental education or sustainable development and that that's why universities and many higher education institutions have failed in discharging their duties because uh, uh, the, the the universities have left it up to the institutions to conduct their exams and submit the results and whatever institutions are there most of don't have uh, their regular faculties who are experts in the field of environment and those who are having it they are not going to do it practically but here in our college as we are a partner with you now with dais we have started with the uh, some of the activities like we have started uh, treating our waste water and we are recycling the water then we have started with the recharging the uh, uh, bore wells and uh, we have started uh, harvesting the rain water as well we are uh, also trying to uh, manage our waste at our site and uh, we have uh, set up uh, composting and vermi composting uh, pits in our institution and that uh, at the same time we are also adopting some of the villages where can uh, we take our students and you know the population of india is mainly comprised of the youth so broad based pyramid and uh, its young population and that is how we are involving students with the 
our daily routine life where we can look after all these sustainable development goals and uh, to have clean energy we see uh, we are talking about uh, these electric vehicles now but uh, can we uh, uh, run our electric vehicles that are getting charged on solar energy so we are planning to have uh, solar lighting systems in our institutions and uh, uh, that will act as a model for students so that whenever they go home they can practice all these things at their home and uh, adopting villages means we are taking our th uh, theory part of our curriculum to the practical aspect of life because india lives in villages and that's how we wish that uh, we need uh, all the institutions need to be practical in implementing the sdgs and that is how we can achieve our uh, goals and make our uh, cities as smart as envisaged by our governments and uh, make our communities sustainable thank you very much uh thank you dr amarjit singh so it's as i said it's always enlightening to to know uh, about actual issues uh, you know which uh, which have to be targeted and so well quantified structured tangible for us to understand thank you for helping us set the targets welcome uh, just uh, we have the final speaker from uh, on the panel that is uh, dr neena puri ma'am ma'am if you are with us you would like to hear your concluding uh, sort of last uh, speech for the panel we have dr rameshwar das dr rameshwar das sorry my apologies dr neena puri has already spoken i got so lost into what sir was saying uh, just kept thinking about it uh, so dr rameshwar das sir please dr rameshwar das so uh sir dr rameshwar das sir are you with us on the call okay we will await his uh, we will await his return um let's just uh, now just quickly move to our participants who've been hearing this discussion because we have students we have our partner organizations which are also youth organizations we have pankaj who's an artist we have uh, you know chimaka who has joined us from nigeria who's hearing this conversation who's an associate of our colleague um so any one of you uh, do you have any questions for any panelists or any comments remarks for our keynote speaker anything that you would like to say that you commit to today you have learned pankaj aap kuch kya do you like to say something uh, sir i have to uh, recite a poetry in hindi poetry on youth on youth um yes, so pankaj before you res uh, before you recite the poem would you like to tell us uh, for all the non uh, non hindi speakers what this poem is about yes sir of course sure. uh, so this poem is uh, combination of youth and education it's uh, say that youth is not able to do anything without education education is the primary stir for any uh, youth in our in our country it it must be note that the youth is not create itself without the importance of education so this is poet this poetry is all over there thank you so much pankaj uh... you please uh, and if you want to tell everyone about yourself also before you narrate uh, where you are from and what you are doing yes, that will also be nice so uh, so i am a student of mpom previous in khalsa college yamunanagar guru nanak khalsa college yamunanagar and i am starting writing from the class 11th on poetry and uh, winning many uh, prizes in national competitions in india so i have to con uh, i have want to start my poetry can i please sir please pankaj it will be a pleasure uh, i think there is many person who are speaking hindi and understand hindi i will start now thank you uh, sab avasthaon ka sardar yuva hai sab avasthaon ka sardar yuva hai ek 
एक राष्ट्र का वरदान युवा है सब अवस्थाओं का सरदार युवा है एक राष्ट्र को वरदान युवा है युवा सशक्त प्रतिमा है शक्ति की शौर्य और अभिव्यक्ति की युवा सशक्त प्रतिमा है शक्ति की शौर्य और अभिव्यक्ति की ये स्वर्ण समय है लड़ने का ये स्वर्ण समय है लड़ने का पग लंबे रख आगे बढ़ने का ये स्वर्ण समय है लड़ने का पग लंबे रख आगे बढ़ने का देश हित में कुछ करने का ये स्वर्ण समय कुछ है लड़ने का पर एक ध्यान हमें धरना होगा पर एक ध्यान हमें धरना होगा युवा शक्ति की प्रतिभा को शिक्षा का हाथ थमाना होगा एक ध्यान हमें धराना होगा युवा शक्ति की प्रतिभा को शिक्षा का हाथ थमाना होगा बिना नेतृत्व के ये शोर शक्ति गलत राह पर भी चल सकती है दिस वर्ल्ड इज ऑल अबाउट दैट विदाउट एजुकेशन और यूथ आर ऑन रोंग पाथ बिना नेतृत्व के ये शोर शक्ति गलत राह पर भी चल सकती है बिना नेतृत्व के ये शोर शक्ति विध्वंस भी कर सकती है इस युवा शक्ति पर हमको सुन लो गुरु दीक्षा का पहरा लगाना होगा इस युवा शक्ति पर हमको सुन लो गुरु दीक्षा का पहरा लगाना होगा ये जो अप्रम पार सिधारा है इसे सही दिशा में बहाना होगा दिस वर्ड इज सेट दैट यूथ हैव टू फ्लो इन राइट डायरेक्शन टू ग्रोथ एंड इट इज ओनली पॉसिबल बाय द एजुकेशन जब युवा व शिक्षा मिल जाएंगे जब युवा व शिक्षा मिल जाएंगे रास्ते विकास के खुल जाएंगे गरीबी भुखमरी और असमानता को के कंधे झुक जाएंगे ऐसे हमें अपने भारत को फिर विश्व गुरु बनाना होगा फिर विश्व गुरु बनाना होगा युवा शक्ति की प्रतिभा को हमें शिक्षा का हाथ थमाना होगा इस युवा शक्ति पर हमको सुन लो गुरु दक्षा का पहरा लगाना होगा थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक्स लॉर्ड पंकज for uh, for these powerful powerful words uh, wahid wahid is uh, somebody who has lived in afghanistan who has afghan roots but has been born brought up in india uh, wahid uh, was in the lockdown in afghanistan wahid understands hindi really well and english really well wahid is also on our panel uh, wahid uh, so what you understood of pankaj and what you understand of your every uh, speaker's comments so just give us your summary remarks please yeah thank you keshav uh, well good evening to everyone uh, firstly the poem the poem says that uh, education itself no it is the quality of education the better the quality the more better a person gets uh if we talk about uh, education education is as sudha ma'am said it's not just going to uh, the college or the university and uh, studying it's basically a chain of uh, learning you can say uh, getting a new skill set of skills you know it's it's basically you're receiving it and you're taking uh, and you're giving it back so that is the whole uh, point of uh, you know quality education being taking and imparting i was in afghanistan i'll share that uh, experience with everyone i was in afghanistan for 3 months during the lockdown and uh, i'm working with ynz educational consultancy so basically this edu- educational consultancy uh, looks into the part wherein the afghan students who want to study in india uh basically the reason they want to do is that because uh, uh their country afghanistan in itself does not have proper infrastructure uh they do not have uh, uh, trained teachers you can say or trained educators uh they do not have internet so they have a lot of issues so uh you know going over there understanding that 
and coming back here i realized that education you know if if we talk about the sdgs it uh, education is the fourth goal the quality education is the fourth goal well uh, the education itself you know it's so important that it literally covers all these other 16 goals it makes a person very responsible uh the responsibility on himself uh, as to you know towards himself towards his family towards his society towards the country uh it, it gives him a uh, complete kind of independence so well i would just say that quality education is something that we have to you know really emphasize on thank you vahi thank you so much uh... uh alok sir uh, is there any other now panelists uh, who would like to say something uh, especially i think uh, i would like to know uh, from uh, dr rameshwar das sir i think has not joined us so uh, so so paula uh, when you joined in yesterday at uh, 12 hours ago we had a first zoom call and uh, now 12 hours later we are here so what is your take away sitting in new york uh, from all these wonderful people from around the world what do you put together in your ideation space is there a change is there an added perspective most definitely i first of all i have to say that i've been very touched um by the sincerity and the authenticity and the heartfelt uh expressions of interest of compassion of um emotion and insight that i've gained from this i've participated in many un panels and conversations uh but for some reason diplomats speak in very nuanced language and it's hard to tell sometimes what they mean here the conversation has been very open very sincere and i truly appreciate it i feel very privileged and blessed to be here honored and and very thankful so that's the first thing the second thing is that um as always i i find that many of the comments are very um deeply inspired by by insight by their by the experiences that each person is having with education and also uh in terms of finding solutions we're not only there uh complaining about the problems but we're trying to find the solutions to them so one of the things that called my attention was the fact that I don't rem- not remember the name of the speaker but she mentioned that there was um an experiment with blended education in rural areas or remote areas in India that didn't have access to technology where the kids were uh, went out with committed teachers to do actions and activities that kept them engaged for 3 hours I think there are different modalities to learning and I think that hands-on learning uh project learning even if outside or uh, you know cultivating vegetables or raising a garden or uh, exploring nature are important in themselves i think that that really brings a lot of depth uh to the educational experience and the human touch i think that we cannot lose the human touch in all of this pro- process and the dig- digital technologies have limitations but when the heart is brought the heart and mind are brought together like we have brought them together in this specific event i think that great things can be achieved um and the summary of things that i uh, or the salient things that i think um have come together or that are i i noticed the most was one the need to bridge the digital divide but also the need to heighten self awareness um and sensitivity compassion empathy so that we can uh build a compassionate new culture uh and this is one of the outcomes that maybe covid-19 and the blessings that this pandemic has brought about or could bring about is greater solidarity and empathy among peoples greater understanding greater communication collaboration and and this dialogue is an example of that and as always with the indian culture there's always a spiritual component to it which is deeply rooted in your culture which i deeply appreciate honor and respect um not only uh from dr from dr gandhi but also from your tradition in meditation and in spiritual practices which is i think something that also needs to be brought to the table in terms of self awareness attention and focus 
And so I thank you all for the participation and, and for the honor of allowing me to learn so much from you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, you, that's very, uh, I think, humble of you to say all of, all of these uh, things. And I think what you have done uh, is put this beautiful sort of a perspective to this because now these concrete takeaways that you are, you are seeing, we can work on them as a collective. All of us, uh, it, not just here, but in the other dialogues who are working on getting gender components involved in the education, who are looking at climate. So, so thank you so much, uh, Paula. And I know it's like early morning, uh, brunch was, uh, I mean, uh, breakfast time is happening. So uh, I also would like to... If I may, I just want to, um, just to interrupt in terms of action oriented things. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I think we can begin to do is to share information about models that are being put out there for compassionate learning, uh, for increased resilience. I included in the chat two programs that I've looked into. One is e-learning, which is an initiative by the Center for Contemplative Science and Compassion and Ethics of Emory University. It's a really interesting initiative that brings ethical um, compassion and self-awareness uh, as, as part of the education system. And the other one is um, the Northeast Initiative or Consortium for Resilience, which is an initiative of the five most important um, states in the Northeast region that have of the United States that were affected by hurricanes and by school shootings and other topics. And so they came together to discuss how can we raise more um, resilient, ad adaptable, and empathetic children. And their recommendations are very valuable. I also included that in the chat. And if we can network to, ex to exchange information on this and explore initiatives, I think that would be one of the first steps uh, in terms of um, action and collaboration to bring what we have discussed uh, into some reality. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, and uh, as this is one problem that I've, as a problem that I have to challenge, uh, solve, I was looking at, and I think you've given it such a good lead as you gave with your keynote for the entire dialogue series. Uh, I'm going to create a debrief call as a follow-up to this meeting for only those people who want to look at 45 minutes of core problem solving in that collaboration space. And then we can put out, uh, uh, we will send out an email to all those interested stakeholders, uh, especially those who are a part of this discussion. So this can be taken forward. We can have, a, a, we, will, we will be requesting everyone through a form now after this in terms of a common set of resources that they would like the group to read. So I think a repository like that is a great idea, like which can be, which we can simply achieve on a Google Drive, and that we can share with interested stakeholders, uh, and uh, and and really like lead a research sort of a project with young younger people leading it. I would say like Catalina Abikanch is there from uh, a college here uh, in India, very passionate climate activist. Uh, so similarly, we have so many people here, Mahima, uh, who made this forum also possible. So I think they're pretty capable of, uh, of driving the operational like uh, procedures. So thank you so much, Paula, on that. And, uh, and I want to know from Catalina, uh, as a young person who did not know any of this was happening 12 hours ago. So to now, what is it that you are going to do? What is it that you are th thinking and what is your experience been? Um, interestingly enough, right after this, I'm going to be tutoring a couple of students with Million Reasons and Dr. Min So I'm going to be going into that experience having heard a different perspective because I'm a student, so I haven't heard the perspective from necessarily like educators. I do tutoring, but it's, it's, it's low level tutoring, so I'm not involved in the logistics of organizing and adapting to the COVID-19 situation. But through this meeting, there's a lot of points where I, like my perspective was kind of changed about the situation. One, I guess one phrase that I specifically remember um, was, I believe, I mean, Johnny said that schools are educating children for a world that no longer exists, which to me was like very, I mean, I think she phrased it exactly right at something that is so true that the world is changing so rapidly 
especially right now this year with the COVID-19 pandemic, that schools and educate, like educational institutions aren't having or don't get the opportunity to adapt as quickly as they can. And students have to deal with like half planned out um, adaptations. And that is in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. But regarding a world that is changing so rapidly, regard, like according to technology, our educational systems are based on like lessons and academic subjects from like decades ago. So we're learning the same subjects that we've been learning but that is like a very long time ago, but the world is changing. So I think that the focus but that schools are teaching on children also needs to change as well. Not only to adapt to technology, but also teaching important life skills and characteristics, like as you mentioned, empathy, compassion, adaptability, and resilience. So I think that schools really need to integrate those and lessons to build that character so that students can go forward in a world that is constantly changing and actually be able to adapt without getting stuck on the rapid changes that come unexpectedly. So um, yeah, I think it was, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to participate in this panel and to have listened to all of the wonderful speakers from around the world. I think it's incredible that there are so many people who are able to share their ideas from, I mean, just it's all around the globe and this platform has allowed us to connect people who normally wouldn't be able to connect um, otherwise. So thank you for the opportunity to listen in and contribute my ideas and listen to what everyone has to say. I think, Catalina, the opportunity has been uh, mostly ours uh, to, to feel inspired from by your thoughts. I think it's a perspective no one, a lot of us have not seen coming in terms of their own brains. So, so what you've done, I think, with this remark, reflection is open up another challenge about, and you know, it's very interesting, and I just want to get Devesh before Aloksa gives his remark, about this acceleration or a rate of change that one thing that we are not accounting for in our uh, in our systems is that there are still uh, static equilibrium models rather than general equilibrium models because of the complexity of having one uh, to, to look at the rate of change because uh, i mean 20 years back the technology was not there and 20 years now the rate of change of this technology is also increasing so today what what is existing and 20 days from now i don't know if 20 days from now zoom will be there or not so whether it makes sense for me to become an expert on zoom or uh, and we we saw it in the in the in the uh, in the internet uh, sort of a domain where when a programming languages change whole careers go like the companies get bust jobs are lost so in this techno i mean is there a is there a predict prediction model that we have that can account for this? Can it be integrated into our response systems? Is the gestation period of economic of education policies enough to respond to it? Or how does that policy translate into teaching methods, curriculum based issues, or, uh, or, or even uh, just understanding whether children's psychosocial sort of factors are able to even take those into account. Uh, like there was this very interesting remark from Brazil that uh, that Sebastiana had made the other day on our forum. She said, on an online class, you may be able to get 40 people and you can probably deliver them full internet, everything. But are they learning the same thing? How much are they learning? You put them on the video also. Can you account for that? Can you know, uh, uh, can you have it quantified assessment criteria online? Uh, which really sees that whether Sebastiana has learned enough that we wanted or uh, at the same time somebody else also. So when these inequalities have ad uh, agree existed in the classrooms from before the COVID, I mean, they have only given us another opportunity to rework this model because classrooms like uh, are entirely gone for now. So it, it gives us uh, opportunity to reimagine classrooms uh, when we go back, whether they have to through breakout rooms, visualization spaces. So Devesh, just as the dialogues director, I want to know now what what do you see finally your your quick remarks and then Dr. Alok Goyal and then we close our, our discussion. Thank you, Keshav. Um, so I'll start by saying that whatever I would be saying right now to everyone in it in this moment, everyone would be hearing according to their motivations and their perceptions. So everyone at this point of time is at a relative reality, at a different reality, which makes them listen to what they want to listen to. And while their thinking mind is taking them to form an image, 
when i use the word chair what is a chair for you it will form different meaning for everyone when i say the word reservation what does reservation mean to you it might just mean something to someone something to some, someone else so what is common in this world is the first question that what is this commonality when we say that if we are all one or if we are separate then things cannot move because everyone needs resources are limited like if economics has to be put in so we have to somewhere come together now let's find out what is the commonality in us in animals in nature everything around us to find out how to live in harmony so there i see the interrelatedness of all things and the say law of action and reaction that every action will have a reaction so when i even think it causes a reaction in the outside world and that would have impact on the climate that would further have an impact on everyone so the first thing is to realize that everything is interrelated second is to realize that everything which is in time will pass away be it a human body be it everyone else and that there are certain things which are real like hunger like old age like diseases so first recognizing how the lifetime of this human being can be really managed well to be not to have separate desires at this point of time which you should have why, why shouldn't you have but to first understand how to be and if we start from that ground that is where the awareness comes in and not when you lose awareness is when you lose yourself into your ego the human ego which in itself means that you have certain desires when you keep doing them you have ambitions and when you have ambitions then you take a role of an identity then you attach yourself to the role of a doer and then you separate yourself now that will make you an indian that will make you uh, someone from an, from say another identity simply a brother any identity and that creates that has been creating a divide now nature and us so we would want to use for our needs coal but then we again separate nature from us so we want to take care of our needs but we don't identify with the nature at that point of time and then our action will cause a reaction on the nature which will further harm us only you know so when we realize this commonality that to be there are certain things which are true like love like mam was talking about compassion so when you have compassion for everyone everything beyond then you start treating them like your child own child like a plant like all these things so when that ethic is set first is where we can help people to come to the now because we will still keep losing ourselves into the ego that is a set fact you know like it's not that people will always be in awareness after a while they still get angry they still want to take care of their children when they come back thinking of they will want to make money you know and and, and those points where we have to identify with certain things that this is ours this is ours that has formed religion and so those certain things have to be broken down while also to identify what is real so certain identities which are real versus certain separative identities which man has made when we can destroy all that then what remains on that we form education because then you will be whatever you would be doing would be for existence for good for everyone it won't be separative in its own self then won't a question will not come whether to make guns or not because you won't see the need of a gun because everyone is essentially within your us at this point of time so that is the starting point from where i see things coming in but at the same time systems have to be maintained because if you stop a part of it other things will also get stopped so we can't completely break nationalities right now or the roles in which we are already in the system will completely stop so what to do so bring the ethic in you and keep doing the same sort of things so now you will yourself know what is to be done in the current model without attaching yourself to the past or to a knowledge or to an identity so now you will still be able to do the same sort of functions which which have been which you have been doing which is maintaining the life force systems economy jobs but now that compassion has come in that ethic has come in so you will try to take care of nature which will further help you so this is where i see the moving way, way moving forward where mam was talking about bringing in meditation in, and bringing in things like spirituality i look at all of them as one 
these are not separate things like you know if you if you know how to make tea if you know how to do your thing perfectly you know how to meditate that is meditation you are always in tune to meditation you are always at awareness while you are always at ego so when you can stop thinking for a while for your own self because you think for your own self thinking is a function from self if you stop that for a while you will see how things are and when the policy makers when different people will start seeing how things are we are love like we want to take care of someone else we have it in ourselves the moment we break those identities which have been keeping us separate we would act in a harmonious way is where i would leave everyone and the floor thank you thank you devesh uh, uh, if um... i think we should uh, definitely get that now people know everyone's positions whoever wants to be in touch we will be sending a debrief email to everyone you know i think you guys should write to each other explore these ideas uh, see uh, who can set off on which journeys together moving from this intersection of these global voices so dr alok goyal sir uh, instrumental in facilitating the entire lab process uh, with the dais from uh, gurunanak khalsa college uh, sir would you like to give a vote of thanks and broadly what you are what you like to tell us before we close yeah thank you uh, keshav before i present the vote of thanks i would like to say that the higher educational institute higher education institutions can serve as a powerful means to help in creating a more sustainable future and in educating the students on the necessity of sustainable development is necessary and we can do it by integrating sustainable development issues into the all aspects of our teaching research and service in the light of all these i can say that our institution in partnership with the dias will reach to the society keeping compassion in mind and will raise the voice about sustainability goals of the united nations we will work on ethics also and we hope paula ma'am uh, paula ma'am will join also join us i also invite all others to join hand us uh, join hand with us on all these issues i am thankful on uh, to all the speakers especially the uh, our keynote speaker madam paula batali dr john Mag uh, dr john magrita harmina samantha arturo and the moderators of course the uh, our uh, catalina and catalina and uh, uh, keshav gupta i would also uh, uh, present the thanks to aditya bhat from bits moon goa and the curator, uh, who is the curator of the global education series and and at last i would like to present the thanks to my worthy principal dr hs khan my colleagues dr swalia dr majid singh dr ramesh das dr meena puri dr rs tora and also the uh, other global partners of the global voice uh, series And, uh, i would like also to say that uh, we will work together with the dais for all the social issues thank you thank you sir now that's that's uh, that's very very courageous uh, for us now it gives us courage it gives us support to move ahead and uh, do these things uh, when we know that this will see some tangible uh, like development or happiness in somebody's life uh, that uh, so just now uh, today is the 14th now 15th is our india's independence day and we are putting together a celebration tomorrow 12 o'clock in the afternoon india time till 1:30 uh, no more not many talks that time only celebrations and uh, a, a couple of poems uh, songs are happening of uh, other than that uh, on the 17th we initiate our gender uh, gender dialogues uh, is there anyone from the gender team who want to just tell us in one minute what's in store gender sure, team okay, sure, sir. yeah yes sir 
Uh, so good evening everyone uh, i am mahima and i'm speaking from india we are going to have the first gender dialogue on 17th the first topic for the gender dialogue would be gender gender and stereotypes and we would love to have all of you there for a fruitful discussion with uh, all of you on the same topic thank you so much mahima that's why the 17th relevant emails will be definitely sent out and uh, if you take uh, maybe some intersections of this to the gender gender stereotype like education how education can probably tackle this issue of gender roles stereotypes uh, maybe it's uh, it's just a thought from my side uh, that could that could be there <coughs> just that's it I, I, that's it i think uh, for now uh, and um, thank you so much i feel quite overwhelmed at hearing so many uh, let's say, like a combination of thoughts which are emotionally sensitive but very to the point uh, impact oriented i think that's one thing that we always need uh tanya are you raising your hand would you like to say something i don't think so uh, i think okay so uh, so please just uh, so i'm very happy i think that more forums it is not about the dais but any forum should uh, should be able to do that because that's the basic place where human beings are safe happy to talk about their thoughts so uh, thank you catalina for uh, for being such a great moderator i think uh, sometimes people don't realize that the space is created by a beautiful moderator who knows when to intervene when not to so i think uh, if more young people like you come up and have these moderation moderating panels i think that if the un decides to start doing that have a co moderator which is uh, like definitely below 16 or around 17 i maybe it does some good and uh, and i know that uh, when we send our voices out the people at un are listening that is uh, either through dr georgios or dr verle or yuriko or anybody you know like even paula for that matter so i mean if practically they are able to take out even one suggestion in terms of the methodology being used here or just something i think that's one tangible contribution we can make towards the united nations um and just last uh, thought that 75 years of the un are concluding happening so on the 21st of september uh, where uh, from where arturo is sitting right now we are going to have a celebration uh in uh, live from brussels that day and we are planning to do something very interesting uh, again on that day it's going to be a global celebration and we will probably be joined uh, by some very senior people from the un but uh, we are not going to repeat the un we are going to do something where catalina has an equal say in that uh, un so uh, so deeply excited to welcome you that and with that i think uh, i would like to like really good uh, say good evening from india and uh, thank all of you for literally being the best versions of yourself for the last uh, true self for the last all this while and for all of you including the team who may not have joined in some someone had power cut someone had internet problems but all of them who have uh, actually worked offline in their real lives put in emotional space uh, energy sleepless hours to make this into what uh, what we 80 of us or 70 of us could feel if all of us are able to do that with each other i think it will be a better world where everyone can do more for each other so thank you so much and uh, we will be sending you the video of what we could record i also had a power cut here in delhi while this was going on so uh, we will be sending in a debrief mail by tonight uh, so thank you all bye thank you bye keshav thank you for everything yeah keshav thank you all bye bye, bye. So happy birthday bye. Uh, in advance how old <laughs> are you turning Oh, uh, 28. Thank 28. you very much. Congratulations, yeah. my man. Have a great time. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. One thing I think we might want to have a summary of this discussion because it was so useful and so uh, uh, substantive. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but I just throw it out there for consideration. Ma'am, we we have been actually documenting every meeting. and uh, actually we we request the moderators also to sit down and summarize these discussions and we have a team which is going to probably now sit down and transcript it firstly in english and uh, maybe we would like to moving forward do translations of this transcript 
and i will just give you an example that happened yesterday the we created a a, a um a video of this and sent it out so then yuriko uh, connected us with somebody senior in another space who said that now they are going to watch the video so right i completely understand that uh, different mediums can be now used to get these summaries out and uh, i thank you so much i am so happy that your focus is on the right step at the right time about uh, getting it done in the structure so thank you ma'am and we will we will definitely do that arturo would you also like to say uh, what are we are we are going to do ma'am an article also about this now at our website at ketoicus so arturo is that something that uh, will be in store maybe in a week or 10 days time of course of course yeah Yes, yeah, so and you can send me um, everything you have, and and uh, we'll try to further develop our partnership. Yeah. So thank you so much, and uh, then, ma'am, then uh, is that fine? What do you think that we can do something else as well, ma'am? No, I think this is all good. Um, okay. I, I just think that it should be in written form so that people can, but maybe not a transcript, maybe a summary of yeah, yeah, uh, points, because I think it would be interesting yeah. for people to have that. as desktop references for their discussions endeavors and thoughts in terms of how to go about their educational um projects and challenges right thank you ma'am we will definitely do that and uh, we will then create one and send it out to all the participants if they want to add certain sections uh, readings uh, you know append some things to that then definitely that is something that that we will look forward to and then take your feedback and advice on it ma'am just taking it one step further if you summarize each dialogue you can have a compilation of these dialogues at the end and then you yeah. could have a publication which would be very interesting i think absolutely uh, absolutely ma'am this is music to our ears whether it's arturo devesh me sudha ma'am all of us so thank you so much uh, and uh, that has given us not just a vision but a target so let me take this forum public forum to assure you that that is exactly now what we will do and uh, we will we will do that for sure ma'am and we then request you to write an introduction for us once we have that in place thank you thank you ma'am uh, thank you very much thank you uh, okay okay catalina thank you uh, for everything you are one of the hardest uh, hard working persons that i've seen and i think that uh, you should also lead this whole process with us catalina is joining in as a graphic designer so watch out for the really fascinating things that are coming uh, on our pages now moving forward so thank you catalina for everything uh, convey can can you do me one favor when you go and teach your kids get videos from them that about their perspectives we will send it out to all the participants so let's use these combinations to get the voices out and keep them going Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. I'm very excited to keep on working. Okay. Thank you guys. Bye. Cheers. Have a good time. Bye. Thank you, Shof.